Amen and amen. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at a single verse, perhaps the most famous verse in the Protestant Reformation, and perhaps the verse that more than any other in all the Bible, God has especially used over the last 500 years of Christian history. A message I've entitled, borrowing from some words of Luther himself, the gates of paradise. The gates of paradise. Romans 1 verse 17 in light of Reformation Sunday as well as some various truths we were looking at yesterday in our theology class with ALT and even in the book of Romans on Thursday night back. It was wonderful to be back on the Menashe campus. And with so many visitors and newcomers here, this is probably long overdue before we get back into Matthew, which by the way is a lot about the fruit of the gospel and the fruit of saving faith and the sacrifice of following Christ, but lest we ever move away from the gospel clarity that is unmatched in the book of Romans and ties together all that Scripture teaches. If you are familiar with Romans, Paul, like any good author, is busy in chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, introducing himself, his gospel, his desire to visit the Romans, ASAP, and his confidence in this gospel and his eagerness to preach it. To further set the stage, listen to a quote I found from David Livingston as recorded by our brother Conrad Mbewe in a book of his. In the 1850s, when there were in Central Africa basically zero Christians, imagine, barely 150 years ago, not a single convert in much of the interior of this continent. Livingston at times found this very discouraging, preached often with little or no results or visible effect. Unrighteousness everywhere, Livingston writes in his journal. I had been recently in closer contact with heathenism than I had ever been before. And although they were as kind and attentive to me as possible, quite hospitable, He says, but to endure the dancing, the roaring, the singing, the jesting, the anecdotes, the grumbling, the quarreling, the murdering of these children of nature, it seemed more like a severe penance than anything I had before met with in the course of my missionary duties. And yet, like the Apostle Paul, Livingston never lost his confidence in the gospel, even if its fruit would only come after his lifetime. Listen to what Livingston writes further. Our work and its fruits are cumulative. We work toward another state of things. Future missionaries will be rewarded by conversions for every sermon. We are their pioneers and helpers. Let them not forget the watchmen of the night, us, who worked when all was gloom. No evidence of success in the way of conversion cheered our paths. They one day will doubtless have more light than we, but we served our master earnestly and proclaimed the same gospel as they will do. How indebted, aren't we, to these faithful watchmen of the night, gospel laborers that have gone before us, beloved, the Luthers, the Livingstons, so many of the Protestant reformers, so that we could reap where they sowed. But you say, how? (laughs) How do we have this kind of confidence, like the Apostle Paul and all who followed? How can we be so sure that the gospel wins in the end? That one single Christian message prevails over all opposition, withstands all hatred, and triumphs in the end. And why should Paul or any of us be so eager, as we're about to read in verse 15, and, and, and to, to preach this gospel to, to any and to all? I love the words of another famous missionary to South Africa and Botswana. 41 years, John McKenzie in the 1800s. In answer to a prayer early in his Christian life, he wrote, Lord, send me to the darkest spot on earth. Where do you get that kind of boldness? Take me to the hardest possible place for the gospel. Paul shows us here, because of what the gospel can do in its saving power and because of how the gospel does it by justifying the unrighteous. Let's read the text. Please stand in honor of God's word. Listen as I read and then... We will pray. Romans 1 from verse 15 through 17. So Paul says, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. 
for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Thank you, O Lord, that both saved and unsaved get to hear the gospel. Thank you for texts like this that remind us the converted and the unconverted, Christians and non-Christians, need the gospel to get saved and to live saved and to be unified, healthy churches that bear much fruit in the gospel. Call us back to our axis, our hub, our loudest drumbeat, the, the heart of our faith, the banner that flies over all that we are and all that we do. Save any lost soul here. Lord, we confess we live in, in some ways, though the gospel is the same, people are no less lost, but we don't see today what we saw in Luther's day of a fear of you and an awareness of guilt and a dread about your judgment and uh, the pangs of a guilty conscience. We live in such a self-absorbed, psychologized, self-loving age of self-esteem. But your spirit was sent to convict. If even there's one soul here in this room, this hour, who has come troubled over their sin, aware of their guilt, carrying pilgrims' heavy load and burden on their back, may this be the day that it rolls away, that they either come to be saved or even for believers to know greater joy and assurance of their salvation in the Lord Jesus, that we might be all the more fruitful and faithful to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The gates of paradise. One verse answering one question. Verse 17. Essentially, Paul is answering, how can this gospel be so powerful? How can one message be so effective, eternally saving for any who believe? And the answer is because... Notice, what's the main verb? The only action word, uh, the main action word that controls all of verse 17. When the gospel is proclaimed, when you and I speak about Jesus to others, and as I'm up here in this pulpit right now, something amazing about God's redemptive plan is being revealed. Look at the text. Not was revealed, not will be revealed, though that is true, but right now. Unrighteous humanity, guilty sinners, condemned rebels, what they most need is being uncovered. Unveiled, that's the word. As the gospel is spoken, doomed sinners, if they do not want to perish in their sins, when we proclaim this book, something is being revealed, laid open, laid bare. Every time you evangelize, Christian, every time you open your mouth and speak the gospel to others, or to yourself as well. In this one simple, profound message, something glorious is dawning, being displayed and disclosed, being revealed. As he will say, jump to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 21. After the next two chapters of the universal condemnation and guilt of all humanity, Jew and Gentile, under God's holiness, he then comes back to his main point. The more you believe the bad news, the better the good news. Romans 3, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's new and yet it's very old. And its roots go down deep into the soil of the Old Testament Jewish scriptures. As Paul will also show us here in verse 17. Here's our outline, beloved, this morning. Two questions. Two questions about the righteousness of God. So that you can be right with God. Not damned forever. Saved if you're lost. More assured of your salvation if you are a struggling believer with a troubled conscience or a weak faith. And so that all of us as believers and as a church can be clearer in taking this gospel to a condemned and a guilty world. And so that as a church we'll stand firm upon justification by faith alone. Two questions about the righteousness of God. What is it, and how is it received? What is it, and there'll be some sub-points along the way if you like, 
What is it? And then more briefly, the second point, we will look at how is it received. It was Martin Luther who said, the doctrine of justification by faith is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. Every other doctrine is secondary. Nothing is more primary or important than this. You can get a lot of things wrong. Don't get this wrong. Or you're damned and your church is doomed if they move away from the center. Justification by faith. We see this today, don't we? As in every age, as in the dark ages of the medieval middle ages when the light of the gospel had been extinguished by and large, it was a misunderstanding of justification by faith that led to the heresies crippling the Galatian church that forced Paul to write the epistle to the Galatians in the New Testament. It's confusion over justification that in our day and age led many and still tempts modern evangelical leaders. I remember MacArthur in the 90s coming back to a church and seminary telling us about meetings with men of the, the, the Christian caliber of, of Colson and, and Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade, and, and uh, J.I. Packer being confronted by Sproul climbing on a table, pleading with them that we cannot go home to Rome and we cannot reunite with Roman Catholics lest we abandon justification by faith. We can't brush our differences under the rug in the name of, of moral and political causes that we agree on. No, it's the true understanding of this precious doctrine that sparked the whole Protestant Reformation, transformed Europe, shaped all of Western civilization. Recovering the doctrine of justification by faith has fueled many other awakenings and revivals down through church history. I Hope that right now you're praying, Lord, what do you want to do in my life and in our church through a re rediscovery or a further study and realization of this glorious doctrine of justification by faith alone? One theologian writes, only here, in this doctrine of justification on account of Christ alone, through faith alone, only here is the deepest question of the human conscience answered in a way that renders all other pursuits, all other goals all other questions empty and shallow by comparison. He says only here in this doctrine of justification does the broken sinner discover something that is more relevant than today's latest fashions, more deeply satisfying than the world's richest treasures, and more liberating than all the shallow jingles that grown-ups fool themselves into believing. After the days of Calvin and Beza in Geneva, one of their most famous successors, and he became a great uh, theologian as well as a pastor, was Francis Turretin. He said this in one of his books. When we rise to the heavenly tribunal and place before our eyes the supreme judge of all the earth, not as we imagine him, but as he is actually described in Scripture, by whose brightness the stars are darkened, at whose strength the mountains melt, by whose anger the earth is shaken, God's justice, not even the angels are equal to bear. He does not make the guilty innocent. His vengeance, when once kindled, penetrates even to the lowest depths of hell. He says, only then, in an instant, the vain confidence of men perishes. It falls, and conscience is compelled. Whatever it proudly boasted before of its own righteousness, now it must confess. It has nothing to rely on before a holy God. What did David cry? Psalm 130, finish the sentence. Lord, if you mark iniquities, if you number our sins, who can stand? He says, when the mind is thoroughly terrified with the consciousness of sin and a sense of God's wrath, what is the one thing on account of which he may be acquitted before God and reckoned as a righteous person? He says, it is only the righteousness and obedience of Christ imputed. We'll talk about that word in a minute imputed to us. All right, let's jump into our first of the two points then. What is the righteousness of God? What is the righteousness of God? You think it might be important if Paul uses it 30 times, 3-0, in one little epistle here of 16 chapters. Most important word in the whole book of Romans. You will be a blind man traveling through the land of Romans if you don't know what this term means. You can outline the whole book this way. First section from 118 to 321, the need for righteousness in an unrighteous, guilty, condemned world. Chapter 3, verse 21 to the end of chapter 4, God's remedy 
or provision of righteousness, justification by faith. Chapter 5 through 8, Romans, the result, the resulting assurance of this righteousness, the resulting uh, hope of glory we have because of justification. Chapter 9 through 11 in Romans, the fourth major panel or section you could say, what about the unbelief of Israel, the defense of God's righteousness? And then the last section, Romans 12 through the end, the application of his righteousness in a transformed life through the gospel. The umbrella that flies over the whole book of Romans. We must understand it. Church history is littered with the wreckage of those who misinterpret or wrongly define the righteousness of God and leads to distorting and denying the gospel. And friends, verse 17 here in chapter 1 brings us not only to the heart of the book, the heart of our faith, the, the, the heart of, of Christian history, and the heart of the Protestant Reformation. What happened on the 31st of October, 1517? It didn't happen in a vacuum. It, it was a culmination of years of struggle. When a miserable German monk sat in a monastery and then at a university, pouring, wrestling, searching the scriptures and agonizing over his Bible. One text after another. But none tormented, harassed, and persecuted him, as it were, like this verse and this phrase, the righteousness of God. See, friends, five centuries ago, when much of the world sat still in heathen darkness and pagan superstition, many of your and my ancestors, yet Europe had already enjoyed the light of the gospel for some thousand years. This light, however, had grown dim, had been smothered and, and much largely snuffed out by the thick blanket of darkness through Roman Catholic ritual and a man-centered, works-based, false righteousness. The only Bibles available, remember, were in what language? Latin, high Latin. In some cases, literally chained to the pulpit so that only the priest could read it and nobody else had a clue what was going on in the service prevailing mindset of the day was that because people were illiterate, captive to these empty dead rituals, sounds like so much of Christianity today, if we're frank and honest, even if we have one eye open. So then the prevailing mindset was that God justifies and accepts you by making you righteous, renewing you on the inside, helping you become worthy enough to stand before God. Sound familiar today? How many people do we meet every day that think, if I just run faster on the treadmill, achieve more, and perform better, God will accept me, and I might make it into heaven? Based on the authority not of Scripture, but of Rome, the people were told that their righteous deeds, such as the holy rituals, the keeping of the sacraments, prayers to Mary, confession to the priests, and so forth, could purchase salvation by God's righteousness and raising funds for the completion of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Indulgences were being sold, the promise that you and your deceased loved ones could be released from their anguish and delivered from thousands of years in purgatory. And remember the most notorious and successful religious salesman of the area where Luther was in Germany was Johann Tetzel. And he had that famous jingle in German, which someone has adapted nicely in English. And he would go around saying, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. He was the Osteen and the, the Benny Hinn of his day. Meanwhile, Luther in the monastery agonized over his standing before God. He writes, my heart trembled and fidgeted about whether God would bestow his grace on me. If I could believe that God was not angry with me, I would stand on my head for joy. His burning question, the question of the ages, the cry of every heart, the message of the whole Bible. How can a sinner be made right before a holy God? How can I be justified before the Almighty? Who can stand? You see, friends, if we know our Bibles, we know we don't just need a minus where our sins are forgiven and wiped clean so that we can be neutral before God. We need a plus. We need a positive righteousness if ever we're to be accepted 
by the Holy One. Luther was painfully aware of this, even went on a pilgrimage to Rome, climbed a famous cathedral staircase because he'd been told you could cleanse your sins by ascending on your bare knees if you repeated the pater noster, step by step, our Father, our Father, our Father. 1507, Luther becomes a priest. Soon after that, he begins lecturing in theology at a new, little-known uh, German university in the Northeast called Wittenberg. It's through his intensive study of Scripture. Be careful what happens when you study this book and you stop listening to all the other voices and you let a God-breathed book speak into your life. Pass up. Watch out. What God will do through his living and active word. Handle with care. Luther was wrestling with Scripture, and he hated this expression, the righteousness of God. All he could think of was a stern judge sitting upon a rainbow, waiting to hurl thunderbolts of judgment upon helpless, disobedient man. However, he was asked to teach a class on the Psalms. It was 1514, and he learns that the righteousness of God is also about man's deliverance, not only man's condemnation. Yes, Scripture has much to say about God's righteous character, as we just heard earlier in Psalm 64. His righteous throne, His rule, His righteous laws and standards. Does Paul not go on in the next verse, verse 18 of Romans 1, to show that God is rightly angry with the wicked? He must punish the unrighteous with perfect justice and exact retribution. But here in verse 17, it can't be bad news Because he's explaining why in verse 16 he's not ashamed. And in verse 15 he's eager about uh, the powerful, saving, rescuing, delivering gospel containing God's righteousness. And so he scratched his head. It can't just be an attribute. It must also be an action of God for those who are unrighteous and condemned. Luther kept bumping into this through a good old-fashioned topical word study or theme study in his Bible, in the original languages as well. Take the Psalms, for example. Psalm 31, in your righteousness, deliver me, O Lord. Psalm 71, in your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Psalm 98, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. An attribute of God and yet an action of God by which he cares and loves and rescues us in our sin. Luther then is asked to teach a class in Isaiah. He begins to grapple with the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah, and he starts to see something similar. Deja vu. We've bumped into this before. Isaiah 56, verse 1. My salvation is about to come, the Lord says. My righteousness to be revealed. Isaiah 45 in the context of God sending Cyrus to deliver the Jews out of exile. Drip down, O heavens, from above. Let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit and righteousness spring up, for I, the Lord, have created it. Isaiah 46, 13. I bring near my righteousness, and my salvation will not delay. One more chapter, Isaiah 51. Luther says, here it is again. I can't get around this theme. I can't escape the fact that there's more than, yes, a righteous judge ready to rightly destroy me, but there's a gift of righteousness able to save me. How do I reconcile these truths? Isaiah 51, repeatedly in the chapter, my righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, my salvation will be forever, my righteousness will not wane, my righteousness will be forever, my salvation to all generations. Diligently studying Scripture, light began to dawn. Post-Tenebras, Luke's, written across the Great Reformation Wall in Geneva, after darkness, light. Righteousness of God. Luther then gets asked to teach a class in 1515 and 1516 on the book of Romans. It was watershed for him. I pray it will be for you. It ought to be for many who have never let this book loose in their lives, in their church. Verse by verse, God began to show him a sinner can be justified before God without any prior internal transformation or moral improvement or behavioral adjustments or inner cleansing. 
proving your self-righteousness? No, Luther saw. The gospel is good news, not because of what I can do, but because of what God has done in Christ for me. And if I receive this gift by faith, I'm liberated. And it means a just God can freely give it to anyone who believes because it's his righteousness and he provides it, so he must accept it and it must satisfy his requirements because it came from him in the first place. And so to us, Luther says, it's an alien, external, foreign righteousness. We can't conjure it up or cook it up. God has to send it down and we must receive it by faith else we'd be damned. And it comes to us through Christ's perfect righteousness. Luther would later look back on this experience as he studied Romans. He says, as violently as I had formerly hated the expression righteousness of God, now I was as violently compelled to embrace this new concept of grace by grace alone. And for me, the expression of the Apostle Paul opened the gates of paradise. Can you say that? Do we not sing no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. And can it be? Let's summarize how Paul uses this term in verse 17, the righteousness of God. Think of it in a broader, a medium, and a narrow fashion. From the whole Bible, broadly, we've seen that God's righteousness can also speak not only of his judging, but also his saving activity on behalf of his people. We saw it in Psalms. We saw it in Isaiah or Isaiah. Same guy. Micah as well. Micah 7, verse 9. Listen. He will bring me out of the light, the Lord, and I will see his righteousness. So we see how righteousness is defined broadly. And what Paul must mean here in verse 17, we see in the whole book of Romans, in the wider context of the epistle, it is this gift. It is not just an attribute of God. It is a new status that he gives the believing sinner to be forgiven and declared righteous, justified in God's sight. He, does, he uses it that way in chapter 3 and chapter 5 and chapter 10 and so forth. But a third angle from which we must define this phrase, this crucial, critical term here in verse 17, the righteousness of God, is the immediate context, as I've been mentioning. It is indeed God's justifying activity. It's God putting people right with him who were in the wrong. Someone said it is his righteous scene, if we can coin an, uh, a, a word. The righteousness of God is being revealed this multifaceted term, God's power, God's gift for sinful humanity. Luther once more writes, the chief purpose of the whole book of Romans is to magnify sin and destroy all human wisdom and righteousness, to bring down all who are proud. Maybe that's you here this morning. To humble the arrogant on account of their own works. He says, we need to break down our inner self-satisfaction. God does not want to redeem us through our own but through an external righteousness and wisdom. Not through one that comes from us and grows in us, but through one that comes to us from the outside. Not one that originates here on earth, but one that comes from heaven. Raise your hand if you've watched Chariots of Fire, the movie. Da, 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 da. We love that story, don't we? Based on real history. But remember the antagonist to the hero, Eric Little, Harold Abrams competing against Little in the 100-meter sprint in that moment where Abrams says to his girlfriend, I have 100 meters. To, I have about 10 seconds to justify my existence. You remember? He is a miserable, unhappy man who has no peace. Eric Little outruns him, wins, and works hard as well, but not from a restless, self-justifying, works-based righteousness, but from a joy that comes from the Christian gospel. And he famously said, remember, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Can you say that? That your soul is at peace with God. All our righteous deeds are filthy rags, as Isaiah also says, right? Right? 
As Paul says in different language in Philippians chapter 3, that I may be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Or as Paul would famously put it in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, the great exchange, a a double imputation, Christ bearing my sin, that I might have his righteousness. I grieve at the tragedy of people on the treadmill of life, especially, worst of all, the treadmill of religion, trying to justify themselves instead of living, wearing Christ's yoke, which is easy, his burden, which is light, and knowing, living a Christ-justified life instead of a self-justified life. People who are forever trying to find their worth and identity somewhere in themselves instead of Christ, and they spend their life admiring and idolizing all the other people who seem to have achieved more than them and comparing themselves to them and hoping one day they will catch up with them to have enough of their own righteousness. Young men, it's in your body, it's in your sports. Young ladies, it's in your looks and your appearances. Professionals, it's in your career achievements, and and somehow I'm going to find worth, I'm going to find righteousness, I'm going to find peace for my soul, and life at some point has a way for all of us of stripping those things away and leaving us flat on our face if God is kind enough and you reach the end of your own righteousness and you say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I have nothing else to cling to. My perfect so-called marriage, my perfect so-called kids, my perfect so-called whatever career, whatever I've done, whatever I have, is filthy in his sight. And Christ alone will save me, else I'd be damned. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed, Paul says. He goes on in Romans 3 and 4 and 5 to show that it requires this imputation, a banking term, a a crediting, a reckoning of our sin on Jesus and his righteousness to us through his work on the cross. We say this in our Antioch Declaration of Faith. We believe that by faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from any human merit or works, the believing sinner is justified and declared righteous as an act of God through an astonishing transfer in which our sins are imputed to Christ and his righteousness imputed to us. Opposite of what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching and still teaches, that at baptism as a baby, right? When they hoi, water. Your original sin is removed. And then progressively through your life, you, uh, it's just really a Christianized Islam, by the way. You, you try to become more righteous with your good deeds and your keeping of the sacraments and as a last resort, the holy rites if you, on, on your deathbed if all else fails. But at its best, that is a perversion of what the Bible calls imparted, imparted righteousness. And this is what led to so much of Luther's misery and confusion like countless other souls. And sadly, we meet many Protestants, and we have people in our own churches and evangelicals who don't have much different uh, or, or better of a view. And they think that God will justify us based on our imparted moral uh, 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 righteousness and our behavior and our holy life instead of the imputed righteousness of Christ. As elders and pastors we in, church, in, in any faithful church that's uh, doing what they ought to do, when we have membership interviews, often you will find people who are true converts and they're so excited about their sanctification and the change in their life that when you ask them those basic questions, if you die tonight, yes, I'd be in heaven. Wonderful. Now, second question, much more important than the first because many have false assurance who aren't saved and some who are saved are, lack assurance. But the, the, the second question is even more crucial. Here's how it goes, my friend. When you stand before God, why would he let you in? And then too often the answer is, oh, but you should see how he's changed my marriage. And and now I do this and now I do that. Wait. You are confusing sanctification and justification. I want to summarize it for you and then get this to the small group leaders this week. Because we need to talk about what happens when you confuse these two. Because it is a brilliant strategy of Satan from before time began. (laughs) to confuse these two. Please hear me. According to the Bible, justification is 
imputed righteousness. Sanctification is imparted righteousness. Justification is an external legal standing or status. Sanctification is an internal moral condition. Justification, once for all, an event at a point in time, whether you remember it or not, before God, by faith, you were justified. Not so. Sanctification. Ongoing, continual process, right? Progressive sanctification. The Bible also teaches positional sanctification, which is basically what we're talking about here in justification. Let's not lose the point. Another contrast. Justification in the Bible is perfected. It's complete in this life. Sanctification? Raise your hand if you got that one done. Of course not, until we get to glory. It is imperfect and incomplete. Justification is the same for all Christians everywhere in every place. There's no degrees. You can't say, well, today I feel more justified. Oh, shame, yesterday I felt a little less justified. That's someone who does not understand the biblical doctrine of justification. It's the same for all believers. Sanctification? Very different story. No two believers are alike. There's a whole spectrum of degrees of holiness and maturity and progress in the Christian life. Justification is what Christ has done for us. Sanctification is what Christ is doing in us as a result. In the Christian Explained class, we use a simple analogy. Justification is Christ entering the house. The Bible uses this metaphor. He gets the keys. He's given the ownership of the house. He rules your life. You're under his lordship and kingdom and management. Sanctification? Aha. Uh -huh. He occupies the house. How about this nook? How about this cranny? How about this cupboard? Ooh, we haven't gone there yet. The Bible talks about praying for more and more of his presence in every part of our life. Don't confuse justification and sanctification. Oh, by the way, you know that we are saved by works, don't you? Jesus' work. <laughs> his finished work. His perfect life. His atoning death in our place. Paul goes on in chapter 5 of Romans to show how his holy life and his substitutionary death accomplished that for us. L listen to our catechism. What is justification? Answer. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. I love this next question in the catechism. How are you righteous before God? Thank you for asking. Answer, only by true faith in Jesus Christ, although my conscience, I love this honest realism, this painful frankness here. How are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all of God's commandments and have never kept any of them, and I'm still inclined to all evil. But God, without any merit of my own, out of mere grace, imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Jesus Christ. You won't find any better news in the universe than that. <laughs> Luther had a cousin, you could say, like Paul, like Luther, was a Puritan, John Bunyan. He had a very tender conscience. He agonized over a lack of any lasting righteousness or secure standing before God. I know some of you have been reading through that again. Please understand, the burden on his back is not that he's not saved. He's already entered through the narrow gate. He's a believer. He lacks assurance, like some of you. You actually are a child of God, but you wouldn't know it, and you wonder about it. Bunyan wrestled with this for years, until at last the gospel truth of justification finally brought him peace. And later he wrote, one day, as I was passing into the field, he's on a walk, this sentence fell upon my soul. Your righteousness is in heaven. And with the eyes of my soul, I saw Jesus at the Father's right hand. There, I said, is my righteousness. Whatever I was, where, whatever I was doing, wherever I was, God could not say to me, where is your righteousness? Because it's right there next to him. It's his son at his right hand. There's my righteousness. It never changes. Fixed. Done. Hallelujah. Okay, back to Bunyan. 
He says, I saw it wasn't my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better. Oh, I've had a good day, ticked all the boxes, been a really good Christian, bumped into the pastor today, woohoo! And it wasn't my bad frame on my worst day that made my righteousness any different because my righteousness is him, not me. Now my chains fell off indeed. My temptations fled away. I lived sweetly at peace with God. Now I could look from myself to him, Christ. I could reckon that all my character, great picture. It was like the coins of a rich man in his pocket when all his gold is safe in a trunk at home. Oh, he says, I saw that my gold was indeed locked safe in the trunk at home, in Christ my Lord, at the Father's right hand. As Scripture says, Christ is all my righteousness, my sanctification, my redemption, my all in all. The gates of paradise indeed. Second question then, if that's what is the righteousness of God, how is it received? How do we get this glorious gift? How can this precious treasure be mine He says it's been revealed, but how do I benefit from it? Oh, the Jews would answer, through the law, through our circumcision, through our obedience and all of our achievements. I'm afraid like so many today, even in good Bible teaching churches. Well, I have the right parents. I I go to the right church. I've been baptized. I became a member. I've uh, uh, learned the catechism. I walk the aisle, pray the prayer. I, I work hard. I have a good job. I'm afraid many people today in the charismatic movement would say, I know that God accepts me and that I'm saved and justified because I've had emotional experiences on a Sunday and I fell down and I spoke in tongues and someone prophesied over me and I saw this healing and I have a great praise and music, praise and worship music leader and he's my new high priest and through him I get to God and now I know I'm saved. And that's just baptized Catholicism. That's a false gospel. Or other people think all you have to do to be justified is die. It's called sola funerola. (laughs) Every funeral you go to, all they had to do is die. Rest in peace. I'm glad he's in a better place. Says who, according to the Bible? If they're not a believer, it's R-I-T, rest in torment. It's R-I-H, rest is impossible in hell. If they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we're giving false comfort and false hope. That's the most unloving thing we could do. You don't get justified by death alone. It's by faith alone and Christ alone. The righteousness of God is revealed, look at the text, verse 17, from faith to faith. Paul's been talking about faith throughout this chapter. He's already mentioned it in verse 5, verse 8, verse 12, verse 16. 58 times either the verb or the noun for faith shows up in the book of Romans especially chapters 3 and 4, and three times in one verse here in verse 17. I think that means it's important that we define it. If that's the only way we can appropriate Christ's saving righteousness, if it's the only means by which we can be justified, we better understand it, and you better be sure Satan is going to work overtime to confuse you about it and to twist the definition of it and to fog and blur your understanding because you can have all the right doctrine in the world, but you will be lost and you cannot be justified unless you have faith, and that means you need to know what it is and be sure that you have it. <laughs> From faith to faith. I love that catechism question that goes on to say, does this mean your faith is a work? That merits salvation? Answer, I am not accepted by God on account of the worthiness of my faith. No, only the satisfaction and righteousness and holiness of Christ is my righteousness before God. I receive this righteousness and I make it my own by faith only. This is also not about what is so common today, faith in my faith. Oh, I know I'm saved and justified before God because I'm sincere and I have a strong enough, a big enough, uh, 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 an amazing enough faith. Show me in the Romans where, where it is, salvation is ever about the size of your faith and not about the size of your Savior and the work that Jesus has achieved for us. Question in the, next in the catechism, but why can your good works not be a part of your righteousness before God? Answer, because the righteousness which stands before God's judgment must be absolutely perfect and in complete agreement with the law of God. But our best works in this life are imperfect and defiled with sin, right? Isaiah, filthy rags. Isaiah 64. Please hear this, friends. Your faith is not the ground of your justification. It is only the means of it. 
Your faith is not the basis for God saving you. It's simply the vehicle, the instrument, the empty hands receiving the free gift, reaching out the drowning sinner for the life raft of the Savior. You don't give your hands the credit. By grace you have been saved through faith. Show me where the Bible says you're justified on behalf of and because of your faith. No, language matters. Little prepositions can make an eternity of difference. Heaven and hell hinge upon the grammar of Scripture. You're justified through faith. By faith is the language of Scripture. But then you better know that you have true faith because the Bible often warns about false, pretend, Judas-style, demonic faith that has no works. Your faith better not just be that of a believer, a word I unfortunately learned a few years ago for a fan of Justin Bieber. (laughs) Enamored with some worldly rock star. Sadly, like so much of the Christian church today, it's Faith is a passing fad. It's an emotional mood of the moment. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. Not so for a saving, justifying faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Bible, it is a supernatural gift of a sovereign God who alone can regenerate the dead heart, grant the soul repentance, and turn you from your dead idols to embrace the living Christ as Lord and King. The Protestant reformers, the Puritans, Every faithful pastor and elder spends a lifetime hammering out careful biblical definitions of true faith in contrast to all cheap imitations and spurious diversions. We have this on our website under elder statements about children, how to know when young or old a person is ready to be baptized. How do you know if you're converted? The reformers summed it up with three aspects of saving faith in contrast to all perversions of that. K-A-T is what I'll use to help you. Knowledge, assent, and trust. K-A-T. The three biblical components. Without any one of these, your soul is lost and you cannot be redeemed. K, knowledge. It's the intellectual component. The historic facts. The living person of the Lord Jesus, son of man, son of God, slain for sinners, risen and ascended, The message of the whole Bible, where Paul starts earlier in chapter 1, not a blind faith, not a leap in the dark, not just true for you, works for you, feels right. No, Christian faith is grounded in objective propositional truth of the gospel. Knowledge, the intellectual part. And then there's assent, the, you might call, emotional aspect. Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things now seen, Not, not yet seen, right? not just intellectual, it's a deep conviction. It's a heart persuasion. It's a faith-filled boldness. I personally accept he's not just a Savior, uh, uh, the Savior. He's my Savior for my sin and my guilt. Okay, knowledge, the intellectual part. A, assent, or a kind of emotional aspect of saving faith. And then T, trust, the volitional aspect. Fiducia, as they called it in the Latin. Justifying faith can't stop short of this. Knowing and accepting Christ leads to entrusting, right? The chair analogy. You don't just look and say, oh, good, it works, great. You actually put yourself in it. And in this case, you entrust yourself to him. You bank your eternity. You surrender your life. You rest your everlasting soul upon the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look at John's Gospel. Every page of the Gospel of John. Saving faith means coming, eating, drinking, knowing, loving, obeying, following Christ as Lord as we've been seeing in Matthew as well on Sunday mornings. That's why Paul speaks in Romans of the obedience of faith. All of chapter four is the living, risk-taking, bold, maturing faith of Abraham in action, which began at salvation, justification, and then is evidenced through sanctification. Look at the text again. How we've seen what is this righteousness of God? How is it received? Notice he uses a strong emphatic term here, from faith to faith. The idea simply seems to be, though theologians have debated this for centuries, faith from first to last, from beginning to end, from start to finish, all of faith, only faith, nothing but faith. Faith. 
And then he quotes from Habakkuk. As he said back in verse 2, this gospel is new, yet it is old, rooted in the Old Testament scriptures, as he often does in Romans. So here, he pulls from Habakkuk, who's contrasting the proud. Habakkuk chapter 2, he says, the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the just shall live by faith. Same phrase Paul uses again in Galatians chapter 3. No one's justified by the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Became a curse for us. The just shall live by faith. Same thing again over in Hebrews chapter 10. Before he comes into the hall of faith in chapter 11. You're saved by faith alone. And you're sanctified by this living faith. The just shall live by faith. Listen again to Luther. He writes, night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement, the just shall live by his faith. Then, he says, I finally, I grasped that the justice of God is the righteousness by which through grace alone and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereafter, he says, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. I pray if you have not had that experience, God would do that today. I love the way one scholar puts it. The Jews speak of Moses summing up all of God's law in 613 precepts. Oh, but David in the 15th Psalm reduced it to 11. Oh, yes, but Isaiah brought it down to six in one of his prophecies. And Micah, remember, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. Did you justly love mercy? Walk humbly. Thank you. Micah got it down to three. Oh, and then Isaiah, in another text, got it down to two. But hats off to Habakkuk. He gets it down to one essential summary of the whole law of God. If you want to know how God saves, <laughs> for those who are guilty under his law, the whole message of salvation, Old and New Testament, the just shall live by faith. And then this writer says, Habakkuk's grandson, Martin Luther. <laughs> This became a banner of the Protestant Reformation, the just to live by faith. A marvelous cameo of scriptural truth. He says it's safe to say that the truth of this one clause in this single line of scripture has had as much or more profound an effect upon the history of the West as the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence. The just shall live by faith. How appropriate as we come tonight to King David being forgiven in 2 Samuel 12. How can a holy God, through the prophet Nathan, look at a so-called man of God who totally failed, who is an immoral, adulterous, perverted, lust-filled, follows his loins, sleeps with a woman, steals her from her husband, lies to the husband, has the husband murdered, and God can say, as we'll see tonight, I'm not stealing your sermon, brother. <laughs> your sin is forgiven when David repented. Only the cross can explain a God who justifies the wicked. The gates of paradise. I close with this. I was a couple years ago out for a walk in our lovely little green belt in Sundowner, where we live, and met a neighbor I had met once before, and somehow it came up that I was a pastor, and his son, I think 11 or 12 years old, did something that I found is rare, and it was uncommon. He says, right in front of me, he says, Dad, what is a pastor? What does a pastor do? Dad paused, and so I jumped in. I said, I get to spend my whole life telling people about a God who forgives sinners and justifies the guilty. You want to know how? And they went on their way, <laughs> sadly. I get to tell the successful God doesn't love them anymore. I get to tell the most unsuccessful God doesn't love them any less for any who repent and believe in Christ alone. Let's pray. Our Father indeed, what a glorious truth the greatest of all comforts, whatever our circumstances, to know that in light of your holy law left to ourselves, we are more wicked, damned, judged, and doomed than we had any idea or could ever realize apart from the convicting work of your Spirit. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, for any 
troubled soul, any repentant sinner who would ever believe and look to him, we in Christ are more loved than we have dreamed in our wildest imaginations. Thank you, we can take you at your word. We can say with the hymn writer of old, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress, amidst flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay? Fully absolved through these I am, from sin and fear, from guilt and shame. Lord, how we praise you. Give us greater joy in the gospel, greater boldness in proclaiming it, greater clarity in distinguishing it from all other false forms of salvation and all other uh, man-made inferior forms of righteousness. And use this one single glorious, profoundly biblical doctrine of justification to revive our hearts, to awaken our churches, to bring reformation in our day by the power of your Spirit through the unleashing of your word and the proclamation of your gospel. Help us to get ourselves out of the way and to see and to decrease so that Christ would increase and many souls would be set free and truly converted. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.